Colorado starts counting COVID deaths differently means the number has dropped sharply. We'll talk about why. And we'll look at a charge by a state legislator that the numbers were intentionally faked and that Colorado's top public health official should face criminal charges. A former inmate released early during a push to reduce the prison population is now under arrest for murder. I asked the governor about that. Restaurant owners want to meet you outside for a delicious meal. A kid turning quarantine into a business opportunity and sweet jumps. And this is not his first pandemic. One of our elders shares his secret to a long life. Hint, you might be enjoying one right now, but I can't because it's time for next. Right here, 24 hours ago, we pressed the state of Colorado to provide more accurate numbers on COVID-19 deaths in our state. Today, the state health department acted and it's going to make things a bit confusing. They're separating the cases where people had the virus and died from the cases where people had the virus and they can prove that's why they died. It has dropped the total number of COVID-19 deaths in Colorado from more than 1,100 to less than 900. You can look at this two ways, all right? Either it's public health officials trying to clarify confusing data collected during a crisis, or to cover up in a crime. A Republican state legislator wants Colorado's top health official to face criminal charges. Here's politics guy Marshall Zellinger. Republican state representative Mark Baisley sent this letter to District Attorney George Brockler wanting criminal charges filed against Jill Ryan, the head of the state's public health department. The letter suggests she's falsely altering death certificate numbers, inflating the number of deaths due to COVID-19. Obviously, the consideration of criminal charges is completely inappropriate. According to Representative Baisley's letter, his reasoning comes from a notice from Summer and Glen, a senior living facility near Arapaho Road and Holly Street in Centennial. Last month, the facility wrote that that CDPHE was going to override and reclassify the deaths of residents. Four resident passings have been directly tied to COVID-19, the letter said. CDPHE will now list Summer and Glen as having seven COVID-19 deaths. When I asked an executive at the facility what that meant, she told me they were trying to be transparent, but would not explain if the discrepancy involved patients who tested positive for COVID-19, but then perhaps died of other causes, which we learned today has caused the COVID-19 death statistics to be reorganized. What the people of Colorado want to know is not who died with COVID-19, uh, but who died of COVID-19. Like the Montezuma County case Chris Vanderveen told you about yesterday, the man who died from ethanol toxicity, alcohol overdose, but he also tested positive for COVID-19. The governor told us the CDC requires apples to apples record keeping of people who died with COVID-19. Now those who die with COVID will be counted separately from those who die from COVID, at least when the data is presented in Colorado. When there is gray area, uh, we should always uh, use for reporting the numbers that come from the physician or the coroner that actually addressed the patient or, or inspected the body, uh, not somebody ever second guessing it from behind a desk. I reached out to District Attorney George Brockler, who told me in a statement that it's too premature right now to talk about this, but one way or the other, he will reveal once it's once he's looked at this, he'll say whether there is something going on or not. Uh, he'll make that public either way, Kyle. And certainly we've asked for accurate numbers. We have asked for clarity where possible. But at the end of the day, there are going to be some number of cases where they just don't know. They're not always doing COVID-19 tests on people who have passed away or risking an autopsy. And even with the CDC uh, requirements, you don't need a positive test to necessarily be lumped in with those cases that say you're a COVID-19 death, which is why today's separation of the numbers will be helpful moving forward, but super confusing as we look backwards now. Yeah, accuracy and clarity are not always present at the same moment. Marshall, thank you. Representative Baisley told me by email, quote, I have tried to imagine an honorable reason for overriding a physician's professional determination of cause of death, but without hearing justification from the executive director of CDPHE, I can only conclude that replacing the truth with a falsehood is inappropriate. Most important, if we in government do not remain open, honest, and transparent about the facts of the pandemic, how can we expect Coloradans to trust the emergency orders? A post office in Denver is defying a public health order to shut down after the city's health department found that several employees had tested positive for COVID-19. And there were other issues found upon inspection. 
60% of employees were not wearing masks or weren't wearing them correctly. There were no procedures in place for social distancing at the post office on Bucktail Boulevard. No employees entering or exiting were screened for the virus and the facility wasn't sanitizing properly. Denver's health department said shut it down yesterday, yet today that post office opened saying that it's under the control of the federal government. Coloradans are asked to pause for a moment of silence tonight at seven o'clock in remembrance of the Coloradans who have died during the pandemic. Perhaps people are gonna step out to front porches or sidewalks to be near neighbors and the governor asks that people wear masks to show that they are also doing their part. Colorado has been trying to reduce the prison population since we know the virus spreads easily there. Cornelius Haney was due to get out in August after seven years for robbery. But aided by an executive order from Governor Polis to lower the prison population, Haney got out early last month. This last weekend, Denver police said Haney murdered 21-year-old Heather Perry. The motive for the killing is not clear. Today, I asked the governor about Haney's early release. No prisoner who is a danger to society should be released early in any situation. And of course, uh, nobody on that parole board thought that this person was going to do what they allegedly did. But they couldn't have held him much longer under the law. He had to be released by August. Prosecutors have charged Haney with 14 criminal counts, including first degree murder. States facing a $3.3 billion budget deficit. So there's not enough money for everything that the state wants or needs. Legislators have made clear that one of their priorities is funding the response to the pandemic. Yet mental health resources could be cut. Our new Roy had some questions about that. There is both empathy. I really sympathize with the folks with the Joint Budget Committee. And strategy. Whatever can be defended for the sake of the health of the population. The state's Joint Budget Committee is dealing with a more than $3 billion shortfall for the fiscal year that starts in July. On the list of debated cuts, $1.6 million from jail-based behavioral health services, reducing money to raise awareness for resources like the Colorado Crisis Services that saw a record-breaking number of people reaching out for help in February, March, and April, and cutting back on funding already promised to help low-income individuals access help. Uh, we know that there are people who are in even more vulnerable positions. Part of the response to COVID-19 includes addressing mental health. Funding the pandemic response is still a budget priority. That's the toughest part of the of where we're at right now. So we asked the Democratic House Majority Leader why mental health resources are facing cuts. It's not really how can we add to the programs to help them. It's how can we limit the reductions. That also means looking elsewhere for alternatives. Are, are there ways that we can partner with the federal government? At the end of the day, so many resources are going towards one health crisis that's had such a massive economic impact. There isn't enough money for all the other needs. The state had been making good progress. That progress is sort of being brought to a standstill. That doesn't make the vulnerability or the needs of those folks go away. So, of course, the Colorado Crisis Services is available 24-7, and everything we were talking about could also be potentially impacting help when it comes to substance abuse. Now, in total, there are 370 proposed bills that are still in the pipeline, and Kyle, we were told today that a lot of those are most likely going to be postponed. You know, Anusha, one thing that we talk about every legislative session is that the cheaper your idea is, the better chance of it passing. I imagine that really applies now. Oh, absolutely. I mean, Mental Health Colorado said their only hopes at this point that they think could even be passive is if it's fast and if it's free. So an example of that could be improving educator training for mental health, which would be something that the educator might have to pay out of pocket. So that's a possibility. All right. Anusha Roy reporting as always from the Brick House. Thank you, Anusha. Restaurant owners in Boulder are thinking of taking to the streets shutting them down, European style, for dining under the blue Colorado sky. It would be super social distancy, and those restaurants really need a reopening plan fast. We talked with Kevin Daly. His place has been closed down since March 27th. I kind of equate my business as a social gathering space, so I don't really want to open for inside occupancy until there's a vaccine. People would have picnic tables out here. My name is Kevin J. Daly, and I am the proprietor and founder of the Mountain Sun Pub and Brewery. We closed for in-store dining on March 15th, 
It wasn't profitable and it wasn't fun. And so we seized all operations 100% on March 27th. You take the tables from the inside of the restaurant and put them outside, just create a big outdoor space. Europe's been doing this for thousands of years. Think any piazza or gathering space in any European city. There's a multi-departmental city staff team working on this idea. This is a work in progress, and a lot we know a lot of communities are also looking at this idea. My name is Jennifer Bray. I'm a communication specialist for the city of Boulder. Some of the ideas that they're looking at are some of our existing processes for um, special events. Public safety is number one. How do you make sure that the people who are sitting at a a restaurant table, possibly in a street or in a parking area, will be safe. If we don't get people downtown spending money, then we're going to use it. It's going to be a lost year. Boulder is a foodie town. We have a lot of restaurants. They're a very valuable part of our community. We just have to make sure that it's done in a, in a safe and healthy manner. Move the tables to the streets and have everybody wear something right around their necks. It's very Parisian looking. Boulder City Council is going to look at some of these proposals from the Chamber and the Downtown Partnership next Tuesday. His goal is not to flatten the curve. No, quite the opposite, because otherwise you can't get major air. So we've built quite a few in the past because I've been riding my bike and trying to get air my whole life. We'll meet a young entrepreneur already making money and giving back. And the drumming of hail sets the beat for our resident poet slash storm chaser. Next. Not many Coloradans' reaction to a pandemic is, well, been there, survived that. But that is what Isidro Garcia can say this time around. Our neighbor is turning 106. This is his second pandemic, celebrated his birthday in Arvada. It's like a requirement of TV news stories on centenarians that we're supposed to ask them what they credit for their long life. Isidro's answer is going to keep me asking the question because he credited booze for his longevity. Birthday to him. Tonight I am tracking some strong storms rolling off the foothills onto the plains. This one cell just making its way toward Fort Collins, bringing them some scattered rain showers. The view out there looking a little soggy here downtown Denver. We have mostly cloudy skies across the city. I just put on the lightning tracker about 240 strikes within the past 20 minutes time. And we now just have that severe thunderstorm warning that just went into effect right there across the I-25 corridor. It does look like that will extend out for another about 30 minutes or so. I would expect seeing some large hail out of that cell that is just between Lafayette and Longmont. Could easily see about quarter size hail with that one. Some heavy downpours, a lot of lightning and some pretty strong winds as these storms are tracking across the urban corridor. Tonight, temperatures falling into the mid 40s. It looks like most of the action should be out of the metro area by about 10 o'clock tonight off to the eastern plains. Early tomorrow morning, 6, 7 a.m. You might wake up to a little fog, possibly even some mist, but it won't last long. Sunshine is back. Possibly a quick isolated storm, primarily around the southern foothills. Otherwise, it looks like a pretty dry day for us. 70 degrees right on the dot here in Denver. We continue to climb low 80s on Sunday, and then the heat is on. Upper 80s, close to 90 early next week. But next week will be a windy one, so we will keep a, a close eye on high fire danger around here, Kyle. Thank you, Danielle. Hey, when hail falls, us normal people take cover. Meteorologist Corey Rebenhagen is not normal. Hail, or any interesting weather, gets him feeling poetic. Corey Reppenhagen is on the weather beat. There's ice in the clouds, the other kind of spring storms. Dimples on my hood. That was Corey Reppenhagen on the weather beat. Ever since Next came on the air almost four years ago, we've carved out time each Friday for the sole purpose of showing you people feeling good so you might feel good as well. Tonight, our photojournalist Mike Grady introduces us to a 12-year-old from Denver Stapleton neighborhood who's finding a creative use for all his newfound spare time. Backyards and alleyways have long been sanctuaries of sin. Because they are out here for hours upon hours just doing loops. When COVID-19 closed schools, this space became essential to Glenn Stello's sanity. Yeah, 
Yes, it is, for sure. Glenn and his 12-year-old son slash wheelie expert Henry saw an opportunity. How many kids? Seven or eight kids that are enjoying Henry's ramps. We were brainstorming during this, the, the COVID time here and came up with the idea of selling bike ramps. So we've built quite a few in the past because I've been riding my bike and trying to get air my whole life. It started out as a fundraising venture for a new bike. He had to figure out a way to earn his way to that. It's teaching me a lot about entrepreneurship. And a way to keep busy during quarantine. It's amazing to spend time with my dad and all the other kids that are riding the ramps. But Henry and his family also recognized an opportunity to do some good. I'm raising my money for a new mountain bike and as well to the COVID relief fund. In our collective brainstorm, it was just like, you know what, we should should probably do that. 10% of each sale helps those in need during the pandemic. There's a lot of people that need it, and if we can help in any way, that's great. A selfless act from a kid just trying to ramp up the NAR. Yeah, it's amazing. I can just bike around and see a lot of kids just riding and having fun. For next, I'm Mike Grady. So far, Henry and his family have raised more than $300 for the COVID relief fund. If you've heard me say Fort Morgan lately, it's probably been bad news about the food plants and the outbreaks among the workers there. When we return, news from Fort Morgan that made us all smile. That and your feedback next. It's a sign, yard signs, for candidates that everyone can support. There are candidates for graduation at Fort Morgan High School, lined up in Fort Morgan's City Park. A picture of each graduating senior seen there. Some businesses in town chipped in so that each senior could get a public shout out. Not what the seniors dreamed of, but something that the principal, Eric Good, says he hopes they can learn from. I think it's a message that, that all of us can stand to remember from time to time. Things are not always going to go the way you thought they were going to go. Uh, and you, you have options uh, when that happens. You can throw up your hands and say, well, I guess there's nothing I can do. Or you can, you can pick yourself back up and decide, let's figure something else out. Uh, and I think that's what, what we've tried to do, what our students have tried to do, and what the community did. Way to go, FOMO. No longer means fear of missing out. If you watch that interview carefully, up in the little corner, you could see in the interview box, that's our producer, Kevin, talking to him. Fort Morgan's going to have a virtual commencement ceremony tomorrow. They're going to have a car parade for the graduates later this month. And the principal told us that if this year's juniors like any of those traditions, they would consider keeping them for next year. We finish with your feedback. Gene writes in about Republican Representative Mark Baisley's claim that COVID-19 deaths were criminally falsified. Gene says, Kyle, will you investigate this or just turn a blind eye to it? Gene next broke that story last night around midnight, and we followed up and made it our lead story today. I would hardly say that we are turning a blind eye to it. Dana writes in and says, how do we know that the numbers are accurate now? Very good question, one we will continue to ask. And we're also gonna to try to get insight on the process. Who made the decisions about how to sort things and who specifically is making the decision about how to resort them? Rachel Lindeberg says, this frustrates me as somebody who's in public health. She says that she, she writes about these death tolls going up and down and getting revised. And she said, it's this type of information that destroys trust and tells the public that they are not getting the right information understand that sentiment. That's the reason why we'll continue to ask, to ask for uh, the most clarity that we can get. Natasha tweets to us, the virus doesn't kill you. Your pre-existing conditions from your life choices kill you. Sometimes Natasha and sometimes not. At seven o'clock tonight during the moment of silence, I'll remember 16 year old Jackie Paisano, a special Olympian from Denver. See you next time.